Tom, let's start with you here. Trade talks later today. In fact, we're just getting a line right now uh, that they, it will be taking place between President Trump and Liu He, 2.30 p.m. So I would imagine that's obviously very early Asia time. Uh, right here, what should and what can we expect? Yeah, that's really the focus for today, isn't it? That conversation between Vice Premier Liu He, who has, of course, been leading the negotiations from the Chinese side with President Trump in Washington. So we're going to be watching that very closely. What we've heard, of course, is that they've been working the two sides on five, maybe six MOUs around things like intellectual property, forced tech transfer, non-tariff barriers, as well as agriculture and the services sectors as well. And it sounds like those MOUs are going to form the foundation, the basis for any future deal, if indeed we do get to that point. And of course, we may be looking at a point where we get the two presidents to sit down and sign that deal. But that's further off, of course. So we're looking at these MOUs and we're looking, of course, to hear anything out of Washington as to whether or not they are going to extend that tariff deadline, which, of course, is on March the 1st. Jim, just tell me something here. This apparent offer by China, people have looked at the numbers, they've gone through them, and they've been scratching their heads. Is it even feasible they can buy this extra 30 billion? Well, I think it very de depends very much on the time frame involved. I mean, 30 billion, if we can put in comparison with 2017, China bought about 24 billion of US agricultural products. That fell last year to 16 billion because of the trade war. So it will be effective doubling from 2017. But it depends very much on the, on the time frame here. I mean, if it's over three to five years, that could possibly work. And the focus is going to be on soybeans, corn. Corn, the US is the world's biggest producer, and China has a deficit in corn. China desperately needs corn. So corn certainly makes sense. Soybeans, too, you could have an incremental uh, move there. Um, other products like seafood, meat as well, with African swine fever spreading in, in mm. China. You know, it's a possibility that China want to buy some more pork. So uh, I think it's definitely possible. It's going to roil a bit the, uh, the global agricultural markets because Brazil, as a huge supplier of soybeans to, to China right now, is not going to be happy with this. Yeah, now I was about to ask you as well, who does that order get taken from, right? Who loses out on this? Because you can't just create demand out of nowhere. Uh, but speaking of, as part of the conversation, is, is the news on coal. And uh, reportedly, the Port of Dalian is banning exports of coal from Australia to China. How might that be affecting relationships between the two countries or a symptom of the relationship itself? Well, you know, I mean, I think if it's the, the thing is, there's a certain amount of skepticism about whether it's actually a full ban. I mean, uh, people are saying, well, in mm. fact, it's just a cut in the quota to 12 million metric tons from 16 million uh, in the port of Dalian. And then, uh, you know, Commonwealth Bank of Australia was saying earlier today that, uh, in fact, China needs Australian coal because of the quality for its power stations and steel industry. Um, and also, it would violate a trade agreement, existing trade agreement with, between uh, Australia and China and would China want to add more to its diplomatic plate right now when, it, when this March 1 deadline is approaching uh, for the US-China trade talks to conclude. So, um, you know, there's a certain amount of skepticism and would, the, would it be very, you know, what would the effect be and the effect may be rather short-lived possibly uh, from a, just a restriction, a curb in those imports into Dalian. So, a certain amount of sort of skepticism about the long-term impact on that today. Just as I want to tell me, it's exactly one week to go before this trade truce expires. The thing is, are we any closer to an agreement? What's the feeling there? What are you hearing on the grapevine, as it were, there in Beijing? What are you reading in newspaper editorials? It does, is there a sense of optimism coming through? Uh, there is, certainly, and it seems like the momentum is heading in the right direction. Certainly, the Chinese have their own reasons to get some kind of deal so they can focus on, of course, putting some kind of floor under the economic slowdown here and other issues that they have to tackle. And, of course, the U.S. has its own motivations, and President Trump as well, political motivations for trying to strike a deal. So the real question is, if they do get a deal, which maybe it looks like they are going to be, what kind of deal will it be and how is it going to be enforced? The proof, of course, is going to be in the prover proverbial pudding when it comes to this deal. So that's what people are going to be pouring over uh, when we get any more details about how this is going to come to play. And then, of course, we need those usual caveats around the fact that even if you get the trade deal, these tensions around technology, around national security, around geopolitical tensions between the two sides are only rising. And there's, there's no signs yet from either US uh, side or China that they've put in place structures or systems to be able to address those tensions. So that is further forward.